Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel and welcome to Halloween week. I am not as creative as other YouTubers so I don't have a creative name for Halloween week so I'm just going to be calling it Halloween week. I know a lot of true crimers have come up with names and I don't want to steal anyone's name. I don't want to use the same name as anyone else so this is Halloween week. I know a lot of true crimers will do a new video every single day the week of Halloween or even during the month, but I don't have a ton of extra time to be able to do that. I wish I could, but I still wanted to do something very special for you guys this week because duh, I love Halloween and I know you guys do too. So I will be putting out three or four videos this week instead of just one in the spirit of Halloween. And to kick off Halloween week, you guys already know that I like doing the missing 411 case Cases, so that is the case that we are going to be covering today. But before we get into today's video, I know that you guys have noticed that I'm wearing these super cute pink glasses and that is because today's sponsor is Glasses USA, which I am literally so excited about because I know a lot of you guys don't know this, but I actually do wear contacts and glasses and I have a very, very strong prescription, a negative seven if anyone knows anything about prescriptions. That's pretty bad. And if you're anything like me, you know how expensive and how much of a hassle it can be to get your glasses from the eye doctor. However, it is now so much easier and cheaper to get glasses with Glasses USA. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving your home, all at affordable prices. Glasses USA offers over 4,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses, including in-house brands like Muse, these ones, and Amelia E, which is these sunglasses that I got. And they also have designer brands like Ray-Bans, Oakley, Gucci, and so many more. You can find any style or color that you can imagine, as well as specialty glasses like kids' glasses, sports glasses, safety glasses, and more. Now, with how high my prescription is, I thought that it would be too high to find cute glasses, but with Glasses USA, you can add any prescription to almost any pair of frames including sunglasses, which is what these are. These are prescription sunglasses, and they have blue light blocking glasses, which is what I'm wearing right now. And honestly, glasses from my eye doctor have lenses that are so thin thick that I absolutely hate wearing my glasses outside of my house and especially in videos, which is why you guys have never seen them on me before because I don't want anyone to see them on me. But these lenses are so thin and they fit into these frames so nicely that I honestly, I couldn't even believe it when I saw them. I did not know it was possible to get any thinner lenses with how high my prescription is, but Glasses USA found a way. The best part is its price point. A complete pair of glasses start at only $30 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. It's so easy. All you have to do is enter your prescription online, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders, no matter how much you spend, and if for some reason you aren't happy with your order, you have 14 days to return it for a full refund, exchange, or 100% store credit, no hassle, no questions asked. The exciting news is that by clicking my link in the description box below, my subscribers can sign up for 65% off of your first pair of glasses, which is honestly amazing to me considering that they are already so cheap. And if you like any of the glasses that I just showed you or the ones that I'm wearing, those links will be down below. Let me just show you them again. These are my sunglasses. They are the Amelia E ones. These ones are the prescription sunglasses. I actually bought these for my boyfriend, so they're men's sunglasses um, if you wanted to get them for a man in your life or if you are a man. And then um, just normal prescription glasses with normal frames, and these are from the brand Muse. Um, these are also um, for my boyfriend that I got him. So all of the links to these specific glasses will be down in the description box in case you're interested in picking out any of these ones. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link in the description box below and sign up for 65% off of your new pair of glasses. 100% hassle-free. I promise you will not regret it. You're going to be saving so much money on your prescription glasses. You won't even believe how cheap it is. Thank you again to Glasses USA for sponsoring today's video. I do want to let you guys know that I I'm going to be taking off my glasses now for the rest of the video just because I don't want there to be any annoying glares from my studio light or anything like that. All right, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. 
The case that we have today is about a young man who went on a hike in a national park and was just never seen again. It's such a confusing and baffling case, so let's just get into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Prabdeep Sran. Prabdeep Sran was only 25 years old when he went missing in the Kosciuszko National Park in May of 2013. He was originally from Brampton in Ontario, Canada, and went into the Canadian Army and served time before he attended Bond University to study law in Gold Coast, Australia. He was described by friends and family as being happy, kind, incredibly smart, and someone who didn't put himself into risky situations or partake in risky behavior. He was very type A and liked his schedules and was just overall a very hardworking person. Now, in April of 2013, Prab went home back to Canada to visit some friends and family. He was there for about a month before returning back to Australia to get back to school. Now, whether or not he told his family about his plans has been reported differently depending on the source. Some sources said that before leaving, he told his family that he was actually planning a trip to visit the Blue Mountains and Mount Kosciuszko for a few days before he started back up with school. Other sources said he did not tell anyone about his plans whatsoever. Now, according to friends, Prob had never really been interested in the outdoors or hiking before, but he did have military experience under his belt, so he was well prepared for this type of adventure that he was about to set out on and he was the type of person that would have planned everything out and did whatever he planned. There's also a little bit of a discrepancy in the timeline in the days leading up to Prob's disappearance, so some of the dates may be a day or two off, but I am using dates that I've seen across multiple sources, so I'm pretty sure that these dates are the most accurate. So after he got back to Australia, he stayed with a friend in Sydney for a few nights. On the morning of May 12th, 2013, that same friend drove him to the Pathstow station, where he's believed to have gotten onto a train to the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, Australia. The next day, May 13th, Prob returned to Sydney and rented a van from the Juicy Rental Company and then planned to return it by the 15th in Melbourne, which is about 900 miles away from Sydney. That same day, he was seen on surveillance video at a convenience store in Jindabyne and it is believed that he slept in his van that night. Then the next day on May 14th, Prob drove his van about 45 minutes to the Charlotte Pass Ski Resort staff quarters. He parked his van and then stowed his laptop underneath the driver's side seat in the van and then grabbed the $45 jacket that he had bought the day before when he was in Jandabine. He then set out to hike the main range walk, which is an 18-mile popular trail with a 3,500-foot elevation gain that leads towards Mount Kosciuszko, Australia's highest mountain. However, after this, no one has ever seen or heard from Prob ever again. Now, at this point in the year, it was pretty cold outside. There were icicles hanging off of the frozen leaves, the grass was frozen, and snow was falling. This is a moderately intense trail that takes about eight hours to complete, but it's unknown whether Prob had a map of the trail or any sort of GPS or anything that could tell him what direction he was going in and he was reportedly only wearing his very light jacket and jeans and nothing really else that could prepare him for harsh weather conditions. Using information from items that he bought from a convenience store earlier that day, it did seem as if he brought food with him on this hike, but it was not enough food to last very long. It is also known that he did bring his phone with him. Now, at the time that he started the hike, the weather conditions were very mild. It was chilly, but it was pretty sunny, and it was dry, it wasn't snowing or anything like that, and it was expected to stay that way all day. However, as the day went on, there was a cold front that passed through, which dramatically and quickly dropped the temperature, as well as a blizzard that came through, which accumulated about 30 centimeters of snow on the ground, which is enough to cover paths and greatly reduce visibility. So the 15th of May was the day that Prob was expected to return the van, but 
he never did. So the Juicy Rental Company reached out to him to let him know that he was late in returning his van. However, they could not get a hold of him. So they went ahead and contacted him once again on May 16th, but once again, there was no answer. But then by that weekend, so May 18th, a staff member at the Charlotte Pass Resort noticed this van that only had a 24 hour day pass to enter the park had been sitting there for an entire week. So this employee went ahead and contacted the Juicy Rental Company and they told him that this van was in fact past due and that they have been unsuccessful in contacting the renter. That was very concerning to this employee so he went ahead and contacted police to let them know about the situation. So police went ahead and tried to get a hold of Juicy's head office, but their office was actually located in New Zealand and there's a pretty big time difference. So they just left them a message and was not able to get any information about the renter that day. It wasn't until May 19th that the renter of this van was in fact confirmed to be Prabdeep Sran. Once finding this out, police immediately notified his family and set out on the search for him. Initially, they just had a couple of national park rangers searching around Mount Kosciuszko and Seaman's Hut which is an alpine hut located on Charlotte Pass built specifically for emergency shelter to avoid dying of exposure. By May 20th, a full police and state emergency service began searching, but very quickly they had to call off the search due to extreme weather conditions. A few days later, Australian federal and state police, alongside national park workers and other volunteers, set out for their search again. They used sniffer dogs and heat sensing helicopters to scour the area all around where he was known to have been last seen. Then by May 22nd, it came out that one of the employees working maintenance at another nearby Alpine hut, the Opera House hut, had heard someone cry out for help around the same time that Prob was known to be hiking. This witness tried to figure out where the voice was coming from and tried calling back out to this person, but he wasn't able to find out who the person was or exactly really pinpoint where this person was calling from, but he did think that the noise was coming from the direction that Prob was known to last have been. They once again deployed heat sensing helicopters to search around the area that he thought the voice was coming from, but nothing came of it. The family put out reward money and the search efforts continued, but after two weeks of searching and nothing coming of it, police decided to scale back the searches. Survival experts agreed that if he had been out there this entire time, there's no way that he could have survived longer than two weeks. This made the family very frustrated, understandably, so they went out and funded their own private searches and increased the reward money. Now, during the investigation, police had searched through Prob's belongings and confirmed that he had not taken a tent or a sleeping bag because they found them at his home, which means that he was not planning to be out on this hike for very long. Also, initially, police didn't search the laptop that was in the van. Now, I'm not sure if they found the laptop and just chose not to search it, or if they hadn't even seen the laptop in the van, but initially they did search the laptop. It was just unfortunate because they found some vital information on the laptop that could have led them in their searches, but they searched it so long later that it didn't really help. But when the laptop was searched, turns out that Prob had been extensively researching Mount Townstead, which is Australia's second highest mountain. Now, most of the trail leading to Mount Kosciuszko is relatively flat, and even though it is a very, very long hike, as you can imagine, 3,500 feet of elevation over 18 miles isn't too much of an upward climb. However, Mount Townstead is much more challenging and is very far off of the main range walk. Main range track is very heavily trafficked and popular, while the trail leading to Mount Townstead is much more secluded and difficult and rocky. To get to the top of this trail, you have to do a good bit of actual rock climbing. The next thing that police did during the investigation was track his 
cell phone pings from his cell phone and police were able to map out the course that he was taking using these pings. So they saw that Prob was walking at a fast pace along Main Range Trail, but then turned off of the trail towards Mount Townstead. But then after heading this way, his cell phone lost connection to any tower. So this means that his phone either died or was turned off or lost service for whatever reason. Additionally, they used sniffer dogs, like I said, and these sniffer dogs were silent until they came upon an area that was just off of the main trail leading to Mount Townstead, and then once they got to this area, they started barking. So all of this information together points to it being very, very possible and very likely that he probably headed off of this more popular trail onto the much more difficult, secluded side trail. Now, there was other hikers there the same time that Prab was there around the same time who set out on the trail at the same time as he did. It was a group of four men who were properly dressed for the hazardous weather and also happened to bring their GoPro with them. Of course, their GoPro showed the blizzard that passed through and the harsh weather conditions. It was snowing, it was windy, and it was just painful to be outside, so these men actually went off trail and took shelter in Seaman's hut. However, they never saw Prob anywhere on the trail, and there's no way of knowing if they even came close to him. The family continued their searches for months after the disappearance and searched numerous locations, but after spending $200,000 of their own money on these private searches, they were forced to call them off because it simply got far too expensive. They hadn't found anything on all of these searches and the family was just left with no answers. It was incredibly frustrating for the family because they lived in Canada so they couldn't even be present for all of the searches and it was far too expensive for them to be traveling between Australia and Canada all the time. According to Prob's sister, he was a very, very meticulous planner, like I said earlier. He's an army man and he's known to have his routes and his plans. Not only that, but he literally has cold weather training from his time in the army and has a very keen survival instinct and would know what to do in this type of situation. Additionally, he is an avid bushwalker, which basically means that he had been an avid hiker who has been to many mountains in Australia and New Zealand and is very familiar with these hiking and outdoor activities. Now, I know I said earlier that he didn't do this a lot, but maybe this was something that was more recent, I'm not sure. But either way, he was in the army, he knew how to handle outdoor situations, and he knew how to survive if he needed to. He would have had much higher chances of survival than just the average hiker. So the family isn't really sure if they actually believe that he just walked off onto this mountain and never came back, but we don't really know. So using all of this information, a few theories have come out. So of course, the main theory and the documented manner of death for Prob was that he was not prepared for that day's weather conditions and that while he started on the much more popular and easier trail, he veered off onto the much more secluded and more dangerous one. But the weird things about this are that first of all, we know that he is not an inexperienced hiker and this is a theory that usually comes about about unexperienced hikers. In fact, he is very familiar with survival and how to navigate tough conditions. Plus, despite there being so many searches with helicopters and dogs and ground searches, all in different weather conditions, including when it was nice out and when all of the snow had melted, not a single thing related to Prob had been found not an article of clothing or a backpack or a wrapper from food that he had eaten, not a shred of physical evidence that showed he was even on the trail. It would be pretty difficult to find absolutely nothing just by going out onto this trail that yes, it was difficult and it wasn't as heavily trafficked, but it's not like this was in the middle of the wilderness, hundreds of miles away from civilization in an area that no one goes to. He went on a very, very popular trail and and then veered off onto a trail that yes, it's a little less popular, but 
people still go on it. In fact, according to the Parks and Wildlife Service, around 8,000 to 10,000 people hike that trail every summer. So the fact that nothing has ever been found in such a populated area is just so strange. And plus, again, people are going off of the fact that, yes, there have been inexperienced hikers that have gone out and maybe not been expecting certain weather conditions and succumbed to the elements, but again, Rob is not an inexperienced hiker or outdoors man. However, on the other side, some searchers have described the area as being a big rocky peak that just overlooks thick, dense bush that's very easy to fall off of and get lost in. Plus, it was a massive search area, so if someone fell, it might be easy to miss them, especially in the winter, so it could be possible that he went out there and was never found. Plus, we do have the cell phone data that confirms that he did in fact go out in that direction before the data just stopped right around the time that the blizzard came in. And we have that witness who said that he heard someone calling out for help around the time that Prob went missing. Plus, in my mind, it might even be possible that his experience and survival skills may have been what got him into this mess in the first place. Maybe he was hiking on this more popular trail and then just decided that it was too easy, not challenging enough for him. So knowing that he was skilled in hiking and being outdoors, he decided to challenge himself by taking the much less traveled and more difficult trail. Maybe he just really was not expecting the weather to change that severely and was simply not able to find his way out after the storm hit. He could have fallen off of the rocky top and been injured so bad that he didn't have any other options but to yell for help and hope that somebody found him. We know that he most likely did not have adequate winter clothes and probably did not bring much food with him. I do think that it's absolutely possible that he got lost and injured and died of exposure, but at the same time, the fact that nothing was found just does not sit right with me. So because of these very strange circumstances, other theories have emerged about what could have happened to Prabhdeep. So first, many people believe that he could have staged his disappearance. Now, I don't know a lot about his private life or if there was anything going on, but according to his family and friends, they didn't know of anything that was going on in his life that could have caused him to want to leave his life. But if you look at the fact that he went off on this hike and possibly didn't even tell anyone before he went, then just vanished without anyone finding anything, that kind of can point towards this theory. Maybe he wanted people to think that he died of exposure so they wouldn't come looking for him wherever he went, and then just turned his phone off to make it look like that's when he had died of exposure. However, I personally don't know how likely I think this theory is because first of all, he had planned to bring the van back. He had plans of going back and continuing his education. He was in a very good spot in his life and showed no signs of wanting to leave his life whatsoever. He was traveling and experiencing the world and was on his way to having a career in law. Plus, we know that he had other important things coming up in his life. His best friend said in an interview that Prab was going to be his groomsman for his upcoming wedding. So his friends and family definitely do not think that he would just get up and leave his life purposely to start a new life or to end his life. Plus, if you think about it, there's really no way that Prab could have planned this entire thing out the way that it happened. There's no way that he could have known that the storm was coming. No one really knew that the storm was coming, so unless he just had planned to go missing that same day and then the storm happened to come and then, you know, he decided, wow, this is even more convincing, this is great, you know, this just adds to my story and makes it more convincing. I guess I could see that, but I just think that's way too much of a coincidence and I don't really think that that happen that way. Now, I could see that if he did want to, you know, go off and start a new life, that he would want to visit his family first and then, you know, go as far away as possible to do this so that they didn't find him. So being in Australia made it very, very difficult for them to come out and search for him. So I guess that does kind of make sense, but that's really the only thing that even makes sense in this. 
the rest of this doesn't even make sense and there's really no evidence pointing towards it. Then of course, there's always the possibility of foul play being involved. One of Prob's friends said in an interview that he thinks it's much more likely that foul play was involved than Prob just running off or even succumbing to the elements. This friend said that Prob was traveling pretty much everywhere and made a ton of friends on the way and would travel around with these new friends that he would make. He said that Prob was the type of person that would just bump into someone and would just make friends with them. So he thinks that this could have made it a lot more likely that he bumped into someone with bad intentions and made him more vulnerable to someone harming him. Plus, he was traveling alone and we know that no matter who you are or what you look like, that can make anyone more of a target. They are alone in a place that they aren't familiar with. They don't know their surroundings and they really wouldn't have a way to contact anyone and so it makes sense that he could have been a target. Maybe he even met someone on this hike and they harmed him or maybe as he was hiking he ran into someone who had bad intentions. I do think that the fact that his body or any other evidence was never found could point to him being harmed and then someone taking him off the trail or hiding him. Again, just because he was never found. But of course, like I've been saying throughout this entire video, the main trail is quite a popular trail. So unless this is someone who lives completely off the grid and knows this entire national park very well and knows how to get around using only secluded backways, obviously it would have been impossible for a person to carry an entire man's body over a trail on a popular trail without anybody seeing it. And even if it was in the middle of the night, even if this person waited until the middle of the night in the blizzard to transport the body, people slept there. There were people that were staying there in these huts overnight to stay safe. So they might've heard something or, you know, the person who did this would have risked being seen by them. And I just don't know if that's a risk people would take. Plus he was not a small man. He weighed a lot. So it would have been pretty much impossible for one single person to carry him through a blizzard without anybody seeing him. So if this is a theory, I would say it would have to be either partners or a team involved to carry this person through the blizzard in these conditions. Even if there was no blizzard, it would be very, very hard to carry a grown man's body in these conditions. I guess we can also consider if this man did know the national park very well, that he could have harmed him on the trail or on this other secluded trail and then hid him somewhere in the bush on the mountain, somewhere that he would know that no one would look or would be picked up if he knows, again, the um, area very well. So it does make sense that if he was very, very well hidden or even buried, that that's why they never found him. So I guess that always could be possible in this theory. Then lastly, as we always consider in all of these national park disappearances, Maybe something supernatural was at play, whether it be some sort of creature like Bigfoot or aliens, he could have been plucked right off the mountain without anyone seeing a thing. However, of course, this is a theory that not a lot of people can get behind, and obviously it's one that does not have any evidence besides simply believing that this is something that can happen. I do think that the most likely theory is that he did go off the trail and succumb to the elements. I think there is the most evidence actually pointing towards that, but it does make me feel really weird that nothing was ever found and the fact that he was such an experienced outdoorsman on a hike that not a lot of people go missing from off of a trail that was very, very popular, it just does not sit right with me. But I will say that in a lot of cases, I feel like we put a lot of emphasis on the searches and sometimes we have to realize that people do miss things. Now, I have not seen anywhere that any of these searches were incompetent or that they weren't done well, but we can't always trust that they did a perfect job and searched every inch even though the family put in their own money for these private searches, which to me probably means that they were very well done, human error is something that we always have to consider. Either way, because he was never found or seen or heard from ever again, in 2015, the New South Wales Coroner's Court declared Prabdeep Sran dead. His death was classified as a misadventure, saying that he was not adequately prepared to face the harsh weather conditions in the mountains, but his family is not quite ready yet to accept this and are still hoping and searching, saying that 
miracles do happen. At the end of the day, it is so unfortunate that the world lost such a bright and motivated young man. He was in law school and he was traveling the world and he just had so much going for him. My heart absolutely goes out to him and his family and I hope they keep searching and I hope that someday someone will find something that leads them to the answers that they are desperately searching for and have been searching for for almost a decade. So that is all I have for today's case and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that he got lost and succumbed to the elements? Do you think he left his life? Or do you think foul play was involved? Or do you think it's something bigger than we can understand? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week and there will be a couple of extra videos this week for Halloween week, so make sure you keep on the lookout for those. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below. And do not forget to check the link down below and head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first order. I promise you will not regret it and you will be so happy with how much money you are saving. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.